Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat 112, featuring the second part of my interview with the independent designer, Jonas Kiradzes. In this part of the interview, we start to cover his games, including Last Rose in a Desert Garden, The Great Machine, Museum of Broken Memories, and Infinite Ocean. A lot of great content, so without further ado, here is Mr. Jonas Kiradzes. Before we get into uh, your au revoir here, I noticed that some people have said that your games are depressing. <laughs> you, know, you don't see very many games that are depressing, right? They, they seem all, the typical game is either really just uh, over the top happy or at least uh, <laughs> cheerful, right? Uh, so uh, what do you think about this? Do you think your games are depressing? Um, most of them? No. Actually, I don't think they are. I think they deal with uh, issues that are quite depressing in and of themselves, but I mean, disregarding my first game, which is my first game, it's really just a long time ago. Um, the Infinite Ocean uh, has a very positive ending. So does the Museum of Broken Memories, at least in a way, I hope so. The same goes for Desert Bridge, Phenomenon 32. Sometimes I just, my stories are stories which tend to move through the darkness to get to the light, or at least to get to the idea that somewhere over there might be the light. Uh, even though it's still going to take some time to get there, um, so I think pe well, I think people react to my games. They they go through this this dark material and they say, well, this is depressing, but they kind of miss the fact that the game says, okay, you know, there's this dark stuff in the world, but that does not mean that everything is hopeless. So the only game that I would say is really depressing is the Great Machine, which really is just depressing. It is. <laughs> um, I don't know if you've played it, but it's, it's I mean, I can spoil this uh, for people, but the interesting thing about it, the interesting design choice, it's, it's a multiple choice adventure game, but it loops. You can't win it. It's, it's an infinite loop. Uh, and, you know, war as a thing you cannot escape. So that's depressing, yes. The rest, I, give it a chance. Yeah, The Great Machine. I, I the Great Machine, I saw it described, I don't know if this, this, this may be your words here, but it presents the effects and the futility of human agency in the face of the insanity of the trenches. You know, I that's, don't think you're going to read that words. on the back of the box on any games at Walmart right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. That's not how I described it, but it's pretty accurate. Um, it is a depressing game, yeah. But war is depressing. I mean, war just is really, really depressing. Um, I keep thinking, you know, some of the things in that game are a bit inelegant. They're maybe a bit too blatant in their, their awfulness. But then I think, you know what? I just need to read like two pages on real wars and I'll find things that are a hundred times more depressing. So if anyone really tried to do a realistic game on, I don't know, World War I or something, like people would be vomiting in the first 10 minutes. So, well, it is depressing. What are you going to do? I can see, yeah, All Quiet on the Western Front. <laughs> Call the of game. Duty 6, All Quiet on the Western Front. I don't, <laughs> yeah, we'll see how that, how that goes. I would like that. Imagine that coming out. Imagine all the gamers running. Nine million copies sold, and then that would have an interesting cultural effect. Maybe that would be the end of, end of war right there. All right, so let's talk about your first game. And you, you, we were talking about this. It's, it's a last rose in a desert garden. And you were only 16 when you wrote this game. So could you talk a little bit about how this game came about? Um, how did it come about? I was, I think it started as a short story, which you can still tell by the fact that it's basically like bits of interactivity with bits of story around them. Um, and it was just this idea of, of writing, of taking the typical post-apocalyptic story and writing it in this rather archaic style. And... I don't know, I just sat down one, one night and wrote the, the whole text and then I actually made the game out of it. I'd been struggling with making a full game. Um, I thought, hey, isn't, wouldn't it be interesting to make like a short game? Something you didn't see at the time very much. These sort of more like a short story kind of games. 
uh, back then, this was like 2000 or something. It wasn't really what people made. So I thought, okay, this is something I can finish. I'll just, I'll just tell this story. And even then, there was this idea of, okay, you know what? It's going to be a story about like a survivor of a nuclear holocaust. And at the end, there are no other survivors. He thinks he's going to find some people and it sort of builds up to, hey, I'm going to find other people. It's going to be happy. No. Um, so I think even then I wanted to say, you know what, if it gets this far, if it gets to the point where we blow uh, ourselves up, maybe there are no, no, no happy endings beyond that. There's no rebuilding civilization because we're just gone. Um, I guess that's also fairly depressing. Uh, and it was written in this completely over-the-top, archaic style. And looking back at it, I see sort of the beginnings of how I write now. And, and some of it is quite good and some of it is quite... Not so good, um, but it's still interesting because it's like it's like the depressing short version of Fallout, which is a game I love deeply. Um, so, what kind of tools did you use to build it? And also, what kind of background do you have in programming and, and coding and all this stuff? As a programmer, I am what you would call absolutely dreadful. I am a terrible programmer. I don't have the right kind of brain for it. It's, I have great trouble. I've tried for years to get into programming. I'm not good at it. I greatly respect the people who are actually capable of programming, especially the people who are capable of programming and designing, which are two separate skills, which a lot of people, I think, aren't aware of because they think it's kind of the same, but it really isn't. And I am a decent designer, but I, I'm not a programmer. I used Visual Basic to make that game, which was the only thing I could get my hands on um, in Greece at the time. Yeah, Visual Basic and an ancient program called Simply 3D and um, this, this landscape-making uh, tool, Terragen, Terragen, I don't know how it's pronounced. Um, so really primitive tools. And actually, if you look at, at my games... That's pretty much their history of trying to make quite a bit with very little and, and trying to make it look good and sort of trying to figure out how to use these very simple tools to still make something that aesthetically is pleasing. I think that's very encouraging to people like me who <laughs> always wanted to design games but don't, don't really have the, you know, the training for, for assembly language or, or whatever it takes. To... Mm hmm all right, so let's talk about Infinite Ocean. Uh, this is, you said this was probably one of the games that most people associate, associate you with. They remember this game. Um, I didn't play this earlier, really enjoyed it. I mean, a very philosophical, you know, deeply, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think it's a stretch to call it a, a poetic uh, game, really. Um, you know, about all, this, all these themes of artificial intelligence and, and, and what is consciousness and this kind of thing. Uh, so, really ambitious game. Can you talk about how uh, or the development of this this project? Mm -hmm. um, it has two phases. One is I, I I first made the game back in the day two thousand and three or something, and I remade it last year in a slightly more polished flash version. But the game, well, how did it come to be? I don't know. I think it's just from all the things that I've always been interested in and in reading about and thinking about. Um, I, when I was younger, I went through a very intense atheist, atheist phase. Um, I've calmed down a little since then. I'm not Richard Dawkins anymore, but at the time I was very much... I, I grew up in a very religious country, Greece, so um, uh, that tends to sort of magnify your opposition to this corrupt, stupid system and the fanaticism and all that. So out of spending a lot of time thinking about you know, what's consciousness, what's life, what, what are we, and what would happen if there was a thinking computer, combined with a lot of the reading that I did, Isaac Asimov in particular, um, and a number of other writers influenced me very much. So this is something I'd been thinking about for years, ever since I was small, ever since I was a child, uh, actually. Um, if you want to go into a bit of autobiography, um, my dad, when I was a, when I was a, a really young kid, he didn't tell me like stories about Santa or God or I don't know what. He told he, he took the the teddy bear we had and the teddy bear told me stories about the Big Bang and the creation of the universe. So in a way, 
because of you know of my father and because of the things I was reading, this was always very much in my mind. And then I kind of I, I, I saw so many games where people were always always telling these stories about the evil AI taking over and the evil AI doing this and and you think, okay, if this AI is supposed to be all logical, why is it so evil? Why do we have this incredible fear of these things? We, you know, it, do we really think that that taking everything over or destroying the planet is a really particularly reasonable goal? Um, so that sort of started that process and got me into into making that game. Um, does that make sense? <laughs> sure. Yeah, I'm just thinking what what you're what you were saying. There's been so many more movies about how the the AI is going to be this awful thing like the Matrix, right? <laughs> Instead of a, a wonderful thing. Yeah, well, see, that's that's one reason I'm one of the few people in the world who actually like the second and third Matrix movies. I actually like them a lot. And I quite like the idea that that that, that movie has, that they're also people in a sense. You know, I mean, come on, they, if they're they're like us. I mean, they're they're sentient, they're they're thinking beings. And I don't know what's behind that enormous fear of other sentient beings, but it's there in our culture, and I find it very disturbing and depressing. It also seems to be a fear of logic. It, it seems to be like this idea that if you're purely logical, you wouldn't be able to see beauty or meaning or any of those things, which to me also implies that we believe that those things don't exist. Because, I mean, you know, as if they were a delusion that we're sort of holding on to, which... I don't believe. Yeah, I know I'm talking too much again. I see. I, I go off on these enormous That's great. Um, rants. Uh, and the other thing that very much influenced me with the Infinite Ocean, though, was um, I was I was getting more into thinking about form and content, trying to mirror each other. So I was trying to tell a story in a different way. Yes, it's all this quite typical finding notes and so on. But I had all these ideas about the story being something that you need to figure out as the player. It's not The Infinite Ocean never tells you what the story is. You have to actually figure out yourself. Who are you? A lot of people just go in assuming you're this play, you're, you must be this character or it must be set here in, in space. And, and I put in all these details that, that, have to make you, that should make you think. Like, you know, this is supposed to be a research station. They ref they talk about going for a coffee in one of the logs, and then you look out the window and there's space. What the hell does that mean? I didn't put in that in there for nothing. So I was trying to, at the time, really to make a game where where uh, the story also comes from from the environment and and from the form of the game itself. I I, I put a lot of thought into that, which no one noticed at the time, but I think now people are a bit more. Um, interested in playing games that way. They're a bit more used to this sort of narrative in games. Yeah, I think one of the criticisms you got was there was too much reading or something ridiculous like that. I get that a lot, yeah. Um, <laughs> it made me so, think too much. <laughs> one of the best criticisms I ever got, I believe, uh, was for the Museum of Broken Memories. Someone was complaining on some website that they couldn't find the button for shooting. <laughs> that was... It's got to be there somewhere, right? One of those buttons. Yeah, of course. Um, that was very, very funny. Um, yeah. All right, so your next game was The Great Machine, and this is, you actually uh, did this as a, in text form, right? It was sort of choose-your-own-adventure style. So mm -hmm. what made you want to explore a, a text-only game? Um, I like text adventures. I've always liked them. Some of my favorite games are uh, text adventures, um, Photopia, and uh, a number of others. Uh, it's, as someone who likes reading and likes writing, it's an interesting medium, I think. Uh, I don't think they're like a lower form of games. They're just a separate way of, of telling a story. And I was particularly interested in this choose-your-own-adventure thing because I grew up playing those 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 books, you know, I don't know, Lone Wolf and whatever they were, these choose your own adventure books. So I was kind of interested in taking that format and doing something weird with it or something interesting with it. Um so that that's how that came to be. Okay, now we have the Museum of Broken Memories. And this was the game that 
you know, when I was, I think somebody said, hey, hey, Matt, you got to check out this Museum of Broken Memories <laughs> a game and, and interview the designer. Now, this is, it seems like a very complex uh, game, a lot of themes, right? War, death, friendship, uh, scar, the scars that we bear. Uh, but you we were talking earlier, though, and you said this is actually a lot of self-parody <laughs> in this game. So, you know, could you talk a little bit about how you, how you made this game and the, the philosophy behind it? Um, how did I start that? I don't remember how it started. I, I remember playing with a variety of ideas of wanting to do something more experimental, a bit more, um, you know, a bit more extreme in, in, in a sense. I had enjoyed making The Great Machine. I thought, let's do something in that direction. Um, and then these various ideas sort of coalesced into this bigger idea of having this museum out of which you go into these individual smaller stories. And then the museum started becoming this um, this rather complicated mind space or, or metaphor. But uh, And what I liked about it was that it had so many different layers or approaches to it because it represents quite a few things. Um, and in a sense, it represents both... Uh, it's, it's a prison in a sense. But on the other hand, it contains the, 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 the way out as well. It's, it has a contradiction in it. And then I, I want to do various interesting things. For example, every time you start up the game, it, it picks one of various sort of opening sentences, which imply different things about the museum, different perspectives. Um, so I wanted to, to really do something about different perspectives that don't necessarily all fit together into one story. They're like different aspects, but neither can you perfectly fit them all together. I, I, I think that's part of what makes it a bit unsettling, is that it just doesn't perfectly fit. It's fragmented. Um, and, uh, yeah, and of course, on a, on, a, on a visual level, I was trying to... to I wanted to try uh, various approaches of making the game... Of, of making graphics that were very different for each segment. You know, one looks like these old photographs, and one looks like... One is completely black, one is completely in darkness. So all these, these various ideas, and, and it became very complicated. It was a very interesting um, process. Uh, writing it was a very interesting process. Um, I got very deep into it, and uh, at one point I had a very interesting experience. I remember this vividly. The, the, the dark segment, I was making it, but I didn't know how it was going to end. I, just, I didn't know what the last image was. And when I realized that the last image, spoiler, well, is this half open door that leads into the museum itself, that creeped me out because it really fit into the whole concept for me. And yet I hadn't planned it up until that second. And suddenly everything like came together in my mind and I realized how it all made sense. It was a very strange kind of emotional experience making that game. I think it, it's reflected in the game itself because it creeps people out. Uh, and I had some very interesting responses to it. Uh, I could go on talking about it for a very long time. It's kind of te on a technological level a bit broken by now because it's it's old um, and wasn't you know exactly created with the best of tools. Um, but there's there's a lot of things in it, a lot of references to poetry and um, various concepts and self parody. Yes, there's the bit where you have this one room that's all about this fictional me essentially writing the game, this designer, and I put in a lot of jokes about my my tendency to make these games which all, are all about password hunting and completely lacking in interactivity, too much story, not enough gameplay. Uh, and I thought, yeah, why not? Why not have these, these jokes in there as well? Um, very strange game. What kind of feet? You said you got some interesting responses. What what kind of responses did you get? Uh, apart from some people who told me they were incredibly creeped out by it, which is generally something that I really like. I like the idea of disturbing people because just I think when art manages to sort of push you a bit out of your normal situation in any way, just disturbs you a little. It just makes you reevaluate the world around you a bit. But beyond that, I got some very interesting responses from. Um, parents whose children had been in wars, uh, whose um, grown-up children had been soldiers, and they told me, well, this really reflects what my son or whatever experienced. Um, 
have you been in war yourself? And that was one of those situations where it's also very difficult to answer because suddenly you feel incredibly pretentious. And you're like, no, actually, no, I just made all of this up based on what I've been thinking and reading. But that feels like such a low, horrible answer. Um, and, you know, if you, if you launch into the big answers about art and understanding things in the world and the blah, 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 it's just as bad. So that was one moment, actually several moments where I didn't know what to, to say exactly. It was, very, it was a very big honor that it touched people in this way. But it was also very hard to respond to it and to sort of, I don't know, to say something. Now you said the it's got some. You made the reference to some of the poetry that gets uh, integrated into the game. I, I saw that uh, apparently it was influenced by T. S. Eliot's *The Wasteland* and the, and the poetry of William Blake. <laughs> Again, very highbrow uh, sources to be drawing inspiration from. How did you use their their work in the game? Well, in all sorts of ways, Blake certainly has become incredibly central to my work. There's references to Blake. I mean, he's pretty much my favorite poet. And there's references to his mythology. There's quotations in a lot of my games, starting from The Great Machine. Um, and I've kind of started developing through these games a sort of mythology of my own, which draws on that but adds its own elements. Horizon, the sort of God type being of order uh, or oppression, law. It's rather complicated, um, which comes from Blake, but I've added some of my own concepts. I don't know. These things affect me. I mean, I didn't put them in there to be pretentious. Um, I have, you know, a love hate relationship with Elliot, certainly, but the wasteland is just this, this bizarre but wonderful thing. It's, it, parts of it are just as creepy and as powerful as anything. And uh, Blake is, is incredibly influential in my life. So, I don't know, it just felt right. It felt right to, in, in the context of this, uh, this museum, which is all about these, these fragments, these bits of things that interrelate, to also have interrelations with, with other things, with poetry, with, with art, with, um, you know, the, the, uh, the graphics are full of these, these sort of collages of, of various images put together. Blake, photos from war... Um, you know, it's almost postmodernist, but I hate postmodernism. I would say the difference is that the museum is not about glorifying fragmentation. It's about overcoming it. Um, but it felt very important for me to have all these things in there without making them sort of without making it a quiz, you know, like get the reference and you get the game, that kind of pretentious you know, name-dropping bullshit. That's what I really wanted to avoid. But I wanted just to have all these little evocative bits of poetry, of story. Um, and I was hoping also that people might start looking them up. They might say, oh, that sounds interesting. That, you know, let's, let's type that into Google. Uh, and, and maybe they'd find something. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. As you probably know if you keep up with me on Facebook, today is my 34th birthday. So thank you very much everyone who has wished me well on Facebook. And thanks as always to everyone who has been donating to the show. It's very important to me, as well as I think, if I dare say, preserving the history, legacy, and possibly even the future of our favorite hobby. Also, I wanted to show you some really cool birthday gifts I received. Uh, the first is my, instead of a birthday cake, uh, my lovely wife uh, Elizabeth made me some birthday brownies. I think you'll probably uh, recognize the theme. But then she really went uh, far out, <laughs> far, uh, far out is all I can say, with this miniature coffee table. Now she uh, made this herself and as you can see has a Tetris theme. It's really, really cool. And she's uh, even better. Uh, she's told me now that she's figured out how to make these things. She can uh, make another one or make as many as the... Uh, as are wanted using any sort of themes from 8-bit games, you know, the pixel art. Uh, she can put those on the wooden blocks, paint them, and, and you can have a, any kind of table that you'd like. Uh, now, if you're interested in that, I don't know how much she wants to charge for those things. Probably that's a pretty good chunk of change, I would guess, since it takes a couple days to, uh, to make them. But anyway, if you are interested, let me know. Maybe we can work out some kind of deal. And as always, I wanted to finish up with a, a quotation. Uh, this is from William Blake, and it goes something like this. Active evil is better than passive good. So get those butts off the couches, guys, and go be active. <laughs> See you next week. Hmm. Okay. <laughs>